Hey guys, Minox here with MinoxDen.com and today I am very happy to show off my latest and final version of the Sith Acolyte Mask from the trailer Hope for the game Star Wars The Old Republic. For those of you that have followed my stuff, you know that uh, the Sith Acolyte project has been a passion of mine for the past three years or so and uh, now I am on version 5 of the mask. What's special about this mask? Well, about a year ago, I got into uh, CAD modeling and 3D printing, which opened up a whole new world for me with respect to prop making. So this mask was completely done in a CAD environment and was 3D printed and finally molded and cast in cold cast aluminum. But let's talk a little bit about the creation process. Once the mask was modeled and I was happy with everything and that all the edges were watertight, meaning that the mesh had no holes, no openings, no misalignments in it, I partitioned the mask and proceeded to 3D print it. After all the parts were 3D printed, I uh, used a process called acetone vapor smoothing to uh, smooth out the plastic to get rid of the 3D printing striation. Now acetone vapor smoothing can be done at home, though some degree of caution has to be exercised when doing so. Uh, the method that I use is um, I take a pot, pour some acetone inside and put this on the element. Acetone boils at 56 degrees Celsius, so it's not too terribly hot, but you do have to watch those fumes. So I do recommend having your fume hood on, having the fan on in the house if you have a central fan, um, and wearing a uh, respirator. As the acetone boils, it starts generating vapor. The vapor rises and ends up condensing onto the part. And basically that vapor eats into the plastic and melts the plastic sufficiently for it to get rid of, I would say, about 90% of the striation. It's not a foolproof method. It's not 100% effective. So some, some smoothing is required afterwards, uh, you know, some sanding or uh, using fillers like uh, Bondo Spot Putty or whatever. But acetone vapor smoothing is very effective in order to get uh, most of the work done. Next, I've uh, taken the parts that uh, were acetone smoothed and I started putting them together. I used super glue to glue all the parts together and Bondo spot putty in order to fill in all the remaining striations and the seams where the parts are joined together. The Bondo spot putty is then sanded down and the whole thing primed with gray automotive primer in order to see any spots I may have missed uh, with the spot putty. And basically this is kind of a rinse and repeat method. Once you apply spot putty and prime, then you sand the, uh, you sand the trouble areas down, you apply more spot putty, and then you uh, prime some more, and then sand some more, and then so on and so forth until you have a perfectly smooth master object that you are satisfied with. Next, I set the mask up for molding. and uh, in order to do that, I had to build up a base. And for the base, I used my mask version 4.5 to put underneath and a piece of foam in order to build up some of the uh, some of the empty areas underneath the chin. Next, I mixed up some Rebound 25 silicone. I used my vacuum chamber to degas the silicone mixture. Even though Smoothon says that Rebound 25 technically doesn't need to be degassed, in my experience, if you do it, you remove air bubbles that can be trapped between the uh, wall of the object you're trying to mold and the silicone itself. If you don't remove the air bubbles, you will have to do a lot more fixing up and a lot more touch-up of the final cast. So degassing definitely eliminates a lot of that work. Using the air-free silicone, I applied it to the mask and let this sit uh, for about an hour and a half. Once the silicone became tacky to the touch, I whipped up another batch of Rebound 25, degassed it and applied it to the mask. The third and fourth layers were added for strength and therefore were not degassed as uh, air bubbles in these particular layers isn't an issue. In fact, I used a compound called Thyvex in order to thicken the silicone and make it less runny. Uh, which is um, crucial for vertical applications because you don't want all your silicone to end up on the ground. And once this cured for about six hours, I used a product called Plasti Paste to make the support shell or the mother mold, which is necessary for the uh, object that's being cast to hold its shape. Once Plasti Paste cured about an hour later, I demolded the mask, cleaned up some of the excess silicone flashing on the inside, and got ready for casting. I sprayed the inside of the mold with uh, MAND 200 uh, mold release, let this dry for about 5 minutes, and proceeded to whip up 
uh, some Smoothcast 65D, which is uh, what I use for all my masks and helmets. I throw a few drops of So Strong Black pigment into part B, and because I wanted the final mask to be cold cast in aluminum, I took some 500 mesh aluminum powder and mixed this in with part B of Smoothcast 65. Now, the way I mix these things is I use three quarters part B to one part aluminum powder. So in other words, I have a little bit more aluminum powder than I do part B by volume. This ratio I find to work the best for giving uh, the most realistic aluminum effects in the end. Once the part B and aluminum were mixed together, I then added part A, mixed it all together, and applied the first coat of the resin to the mold. I follow this with two other layers of Smoothcast 65D, just by itself, without the aluminum powder. Though I did add some So Strong Black pigment in order to make the resin gray. I really don't like the look of white resin in wearable props, so I uh, pigment everything with uh, the black So Strong pigment, which makes the resin come out gray. I let this cure for about 20 minutes, then demolded the mask, and was very happy with the results. There was very little cleanup to be done, and uh, most of it had to do with trimming the flashing al along the edges of the mask, which is, uh, which is normal. The eyes were cut out using a multi-saw and uh, uh, sanded down with an electric sander. Next came painting. Usually what I do is I, uh, I paint the inner parts of the detailing, the darker parts of the mask, uh, by hand. But that usually gives me pretty uneven and pretty blotchy results. So this time I decided to do something different. I wanted to use an airbrush. However, I don't really have any airbrush paints at the moment that I could use for this. So I decided to cheat. So I use spray paint the same way that you would use uh, airbrush paints. So I would basically shake up the can, spray the paint into a cap, let it sit for about two, three minutes in order to get the, a lot of the propellant out. And then I would pour this inside an airbrush and uh, use that as airbrushing paint. Hey, you know what? Not the best way to do it, but it gives pretty damn good results. So I'm happy with it. I gave the mask several coats of black, followed it up with a, a touch of red, just to give it a bit of a red hue to match the reference material and let this dry for a few minutes in front of a heater. I then used sandpaper to go over the, the raised detailing to get the paint off. And, uh, you know, starting off with 120 grit paper, I then progressed to 400 grit paper, 800, 1000, 2000, and then follow this up with steel wool in order to get a nice shiny look. I then misted the mask with some black in order to give it a more weathered look which uh, pretty much completed the outer surface. Now it was time to add the eyes, padding, and strap to complete the mask. Now by far the best fabric that I found for the blackout eye mesh is a simple grass catcher bag for uh, your lawnmower that can be purchased at many different hardware stores. So I cut out some strip of this and super glued them inside the mask. I then used my foam cutter to cut up a few rectangles of one inch uh, open celled foam for the padding and uh, added the elastic strap. Now people come up with all sorts of interesting and creative ways to attach straps to masks. By far the easiest and simplest way to do this is rough up the contact area inside the mask where the strap is going to be attached with sandpaper. Take the strap and super glue it down. Then use a strip of industrial Velcro, the fuzzy part, and then simply glue a large piece over the strap as though you're securing it down. Industrial Velcro is extremely sticky and very hard to peel off. So the super glue combined with a long strip of industrial Velcro will hold that strap down and that mask will not fall off your face. And the reason I say to use the fuzzy or the loop part of hook and loop because if you're going to be wearing a, a balaclava for example under under the mask uh, you don't want that balaclava to be snagged on the velcro so don't use the hook part use the loop part use the fuzzy part of the velcro and uh, and it'll be fine after all these parts were done it was safe to call this mask complete
And um, as always, if you like what you see, like the video, visit my Facebook page. Most importantly, visit my website to see all manner of cool projects from me, Minoc, at MinoxDan.com. Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and see you next time.